welcome everyone for our webinar addressing tobacco use in dental care, which is being promoted by the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. I'm Joana Cunha Cruz, and I will be your host today. And we'll be talking with Dr. Zapontic about the current state of the tobacco epidemic and how dental providers can help patients quit smoking. After her presentation, we will have a panel discussion where Dr. Zapontic will be joined by Drs. Luis Pentel and Rinda. But before we get started, I have a few announcements. The first one is we want your participation. So we have a chat box where you can place comments or remarks about what you are hearing from our presenters. And we have a Q&A box. We ask that you use the Q&A box for questions. This way we can monitor and we don't miss your questions in the middle of the chat comments. So the Q&A box is on, your, on the bottom of your screen. There is a Q&A uh, sign there. Hit that one for questions. So this is my first announcement. My next announcement is about continuing education credits. As you know, if you are a member of the network and you register via Zoom, you will earn one CE credit. If you are not a member of our network and you are joining the webinar through the Zoom, you will be able to get the free CE credits once you join the network. So you are very welcome to join, it's free, and you will have uh, the ability to earn the CE credits and then join future webinars. If you are a member of the network or not, but you are on uh, the live stream on Facebook, unfortunately, we cannot give you the CE credit today, but I'm sure you are going to have a great time and learning experience with us. For the, those who register via Zoom, your CE credits will be emailed to you after you answer a survey question that will be sent to you after the webinar. This is an automatic process and uh, being the lookout for the email from Yolanda Jones. And it's a Zoom mail, email. Finally, I would like to let you know that we welcome your suggestions and ideas to further advance practice-based research. You can send your comments um, by email. You can use the national DPBRN at uab.edu. Our speaker today is a clinical psychologist and researcher interested in increasing access to smoking cessation treatment in healthcare sector. Dr. Sandra Japontich is a clinical investigator in the Hennepin Healthcare Department of Psychiatry, and she's also an associate professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota. She and her team are conducting the FRESH study, Free Samples for Health, in the National Dental PBRN, which you will learn more about in a moment. Um, Dr. Japontich, it's with you now. Welcome to our webinar. Thanks very much for having me and for joining today. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about a passion of mine, which is addressing tobacco use in healthcare settings, um, and particularly in this case, in the dental care setting. So we're gonna talk a little bit about where we are um, with the tobacco use epidemic um, currently. Um, and then we'll talk about why people become addicted to tobacco use and how we can treat it through medication and through counseling, um, even brief counseling in, med in uh, dental settings. And then I'll talk about um, the study, which I'm uh, privileged to be the PI of the FRESH study. And then we'll have a panel discussion with some experts in the field. So in terms of the epidemiology of tobacco use, as former U.S. Surgeon General C. Everett Koop noted, in 1982, cigarette smoking is the chief single avoidable cause of death in our society and the most important public health issue of our time. 
The first Sur Surgeon General's report on smoking was published in 1964, and since that time, dozens of Surgeon General reports have summarized the conclusive evidence from biologic, epidemiological, and behavioral and pharmacologic studies that tobacco use is detrimental to health. And while users of non-cigarette forms of tobacco often believe these products are safe or safer, it's important um, for clinicians to convey that all forms of tobacco are harmful. So this is where we are in terms of uh, tobacco use in the United States. Um, currently, about 19% of adults in the United States um, have used a tobacco product in the past month. Um, the most common tobacco product is still cigarettes, but e-cigarettes are rising, as I'm sure you know. Um, about 15% use any combustible tobacco product, which are the most dangerous types of tobacco product for health. Um, this includes cigarettes, cigars, um, and pipes. Um, it's important to know that about two-thirds of people who smoke, if you ask them, say that they want to quit. So if you talk to somebody who smokes, there's a good chance that they would like to quit. And ha about half of people who smoke try to quit every year. So there's a lot of opportunity for intervention in this population. As I said, smoking is the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. Um, the biggest cause of death is cardiovascular disease, um, followed by lung cancer and lung diseases. But there's also a lot of deaths attributable to secondhand smoke and other cancers as well. And of course, um, you're here because you probably know that smoking is related to oral health as well, with the biggest um, relationship is between smoking and periodontal disease. Uh, people who smoke are seven times more likely to develop periodontal disease than people who don't smoke. Um, smoking promotes periodontal disease by depressing polymorphal nuclear leukocytes, accelerating the rate of alveolar bone loss, and increasing plaque and calculus. Um, and there is now enough evidence to infer a causal relationship between smoking and periodontitis. More than 50% of adult periodontal cases are attributable to cigarette smoking. Um, and in people who currently smoke, about 75% of their, um, the cases of periodontal disease in that population may be caused by smoking. And in addition, smoking impacts the treatment of periodontal disease by delaying wound healing and suppressing the immune response. And as a result, periodontists are reluctant to perform procedures on people who are currently smoking. So that's a great opportunity um, for intervention. And the good news is that evidence suggests that smoking cessation may slow the progression of periodontitis. There are other oral health effects of smoking um, that are more cosmetic or less severe, and these often show up earlier than these long-term heart disease, lung disease consequences, and are a great um, point for early intervention. These are also um, a lot of them are cosmetic problems, and so people who smoke might be self-conscious about these and might want help from their dentist um, to um, ameliorate these effects of smoking. And so this is going to be a great point of conversation when you're talking to people who smoke who have discolored teeth or tooth abrasion um, or chronic mouth sores um, to say that, um, that smoking might, might help with those things. There are also, of course, health consequences of smokeless tobacco use that are really um, targeted to the mouth. There are periodontal effects of smokeless tobacco use as well, um, as well as oral leukoplakia and um, oral, oral and pharyngeal cancer. This problem of why people continue to smoke despite the health consequences is addiction to nicotine. Nicotine addiction is a form of chronic brain disease resulting from an alteration in brain chemistry. Uh, Dr. Alan Leshner, the former director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, defines addiction as the compulsive use without medical purpose in the face of negative consequences. Nicotine addiction is a chronic condition and has a biological basis. Uh, nicotine stimulates the release of neurotransmitters, including dopamine, which is kind of our reward um, neurotransmitter, which activates the dopamine reward pathway. That's the pathway by which all drugs of abuse act, as well as things that are important for our survival, like eating and sleeping. This induces feelings of pleasure, which re reinforce repeat administration of the drug. However, with chronic administration, tolerance to the behavioral and cardiovascular effects of nicotine develops over the course of the day, 
um, with tobacco users regaining sensitivity to the effects of nicotine overnight um, with overnight abstinence. Um, when tobacco users abruptly discontinue nicotine, they experience symptoms of withdrawal, and these withdrawal symptoms are a powerful stimulus to uh, repeat nicotine administration. So this is what withdrawal symptoms look like over time. Um, withdrawal symptoms start within the first two days of abstinence and peak within the first week. Um, and then they last, um, some of them last about two to four weeks on average, but there are some that last much longer, six months or longer. Um, the withdrawal symptoms of nicotine include irritability, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, restlessness, depressed mood, insomnia, um, impaired task performance, and then these longer um, symptoms of withdrawal, including um, appetite, weight gain, and cravings. Uh, cravings can be related to decreasing levels of drug in the body, but can also um, be related to associations with triggers, and that's why they last for a long time. So tobacco dependence is this two-part problem. There's the physiological addiction to, to tobacco, and then what we as psychologists call conditioned associations or behavioral, um, the behavioral part of tobacco use or the habit. So we treat the addiction to nicotine, the biological addiction, through medications for cessation. And then we treat the habit by um, developing behavior change programs for people who smoke to help reduce um, availability of cigarettes as well as to reduce their um, responsivity to triggers. So an effective treatment should address both, um, providing some kind of medication for the physiological effect and some kind of counseling for the behavioral aspects of dependence. Um, medication on average doubles the chance of quitting, counseling on average doubles the chance of quitting, and the effects are additive. So people who use uh, counseling and medication um, have a much better chance than people who don't. There are now seven FDA-approved medications for cessation. There are five nicotine replacement therapy products. One, the nicotine patch, provides steady nicotine throughout the day and is used um, once every 24 hours. And then there's four uh, PRN or as-needed medications, the gum, the lozenge, the inhaler, and the nasal spray. There's also two pill medications for smoking cessation. Um, one is a psychotropic agent, um, bupropion, um, which is uh, called, isn't the antidepressant, well, butrin, um, but applied to smoking cessation. And then there's veroniclin, which is a partial nicotine receptor agonist. The name brand for that is Giantix. So this is how the medications work. The yellow bars are the active drug. The blue bars are placebo. So um, the medications on average, as I said, double the chances of quitting. The most effective medication, single medication, is veroniclin or Chantix, uh, followed by the nicotine nasal spray. Also, when we're treating smoking cessation in primary care, um, we often recommend combination nicotine replacement therapy. This is considered a first line uh, or the recommended treatment approach. That includes a long acting formulation of nicotine replacement therapy, which is the nicotine patch, which provides consistent levels of nicotine throughout the day. And then a short acting or as needed medication like the gum inhaler, lozenge or nasal spray, spray which allows for um, addressing acute cravings. I talk to my patients about how, um, you know, when you're dieting, you might get the advice that you should eat every three hours. So you don't get so hungry that like when you see donuts in the break room, you um, have a weak moment. The same is true for the nicotine patch that provides just steady nicotine throughout the day. But sometimes you're still going to feel craving for smoking. And that's where uh, the short acting formulations come in. Also, some people who smoke, smoke pretty heavily, and the nicotine patch doesn't provide complete nicotine replacement for those folks, and so the short-acting formulations can provide some extra nicotine to fully uh, cover them. Okay, so I'm going to go into depth about nicotine replacement therapy for a couple of reasons. One is that we did some interviews with dentists before we started the FRESH study, um, and in general, the dentist and the dental hygienist didn't feel super comfortable um, prescribing uh, medication for smoking cessation or even um, making recommendations. So we're going to focus on nicotine replacement therapy because one, it is over the counter and so um, it is very safe and doesn't have any very many contraindications. And two, um, 
because these patients are already taking nicotine in the form of cigarettes. So you are just replacing the same drug with the same drug. Uh, the rationale for nicotine replacement therapy is that it reduces physical withdrawal from nicotine because you're providing nicotine, but it provides nicotine in a different way, um, which allows people to eliminate the reinforcing effects of nicotine through cigarettes. So when you smoke a cigarette, um, you get an effect of the nicotine in seven to 10 seconds, um, whereas with the nicotine replacement therapy products, it can be 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so it is much less reinforcing um, and allows them to focus on the behavioral or psychological aspects of tobacco cessation. So once you are not in acute withdrawal, you can focus on changing your habits that um, to take the habit of smoking out of your life. Um, and as I said before, these nicotine replacement therapy products approximately double quit rates. Um, the combination therapy is, is um, about as effective as Chantix. It almost triples quit rates. Um, so in terms of precautions for nicotine replacement therapy, like I said, there are very few. Um, patients with underlying cardiovascular disease in a, right after a myocardial infarction within two weeks of a heart attack um, should use with caution or people with serious arrhythmias or serious or worsening angina. These are patients who are very sick. These are patients who are just out of the hospital. They're unlikely to show up in the dental practice. And I will say that even in this case, these are precautions, not contraindications, and they're often prescribed on cardiac floors um, to help people stay comfortable in the hospital. In terms of things to know about NRT, so these are from Dr. Pentel. Um, so uh, some it's important to know that smoking while on the patch is safe and is not going to cause a heart attack. This is kind of an, a lore that goes um, around people who smoke. Um, there was an initial sort of theoretical concern when the patch came out um, that the patch plus smoking would be too much nicotine and might cause a heart attack. Um, we have studied this now. It used to say on the patch um, instructions, uh, the package instructions, not to smoke while on the patch. And that um, has been removed from the package instructions because this has been debunked. In fact, um, now there are smoking cessation treatment programs that use the patch while people are still smoking to help them reduce their smoking. Um, so again, totally safe to smoke on the patch. If somebody, um, if you work with a patient and they're using the patch and they say they're taking it off to smoke, um, you can tell them that that's safe. And in, um, in order to keep them from completely relapsing, it's really important that they keep that patch on um, so they aren't so in withdrawal that they smoke a bunch of cigarettes. It's also important to know there's almost no drug interactions with nicotine replacement therapy um, because people who are smoking are getting nicotine that way anyway. Um, in fact, the main contraindication to nicotine gum is actually poor dentition. Um, and for that reason, if somebody has poor dentition, you want to use the nicotine lozenge instead. You don't need to do an exam or cardiac history to distribute nicotine replacement therapy. It's very safe and it's available over the counter. And the last thing I would say is if you have prescription privileges and you can prescribe nicotine replacement therapy, um, for many Many people uh, with insurance, they can get nicotine replacement therapy then from their pharmacy without copay, so it can actually be free for them versus telling them to buy it themselves. Okay, the second um, problem is changing behavior, those habits around smoking or what I call conditioned associations. Um, tobacco cessation requires behavior change. Fewer than 5% of people who smoke are successful when they quit um, without assistance, without medication, or without counseling. Um, and failing to quit smoking can be really discouraging and, and discourage people from making future quit attempts. Um, many um, people who smoke underestimate how strong the addiction to cigarettes can be and the need to make changes in patterns and routines. Um, so a more successful approach is to view quitting as a learning process where every person who smokes has to teach themselves how, how not to smoke. In order to learn anything successfully, one must prepare properly and have a plan. Um, and that's something that you can we can address in counseling. So behavior counseling, it's important to know, even if brief is a key component for treatment of tobacco use and dependence. So in terms of effects of, of behavioral interventions, um, interventions with clinicians, um, these are the odds of quitting successfully. So we've got no clinician and then just providing self-help material or handouts. 
And then you can see us, the non-physician clinicians here. We have, um, if somebody talks to us, they have a 70% greater chance of quitting successfully um, for five or more months. And then a physician, um, about a doubling of quitting successfully. And the other important thing is the number of clinician types make a difference too. And I think this is the most important message of the webinar um, is that if you only have one type of clinician um, telling you to quit smoking, that uh, increases your chances of quitting by 80%. But if you have two clinician types, like for example, a dental hygienist and a physician, um, it can increase your chances by 2.5 fold. Um, so it's really a team effort that, that lots of different types of providers need to be consistent about providing the same message that um, smoking is harmful to health in a variety of ways, be it physical health, oral health, dent, uh, mental health. Uh, that can provide a consensus among important people in that person's life that putting smoking would be helpful to them. So the type of counseling that we think um, would fit best in the dental practice is called Ask, Advise, Refer. Ask, Advise, Refer is a strategy um, developed by the American Dental Hygienist Association. It requires people to ask about tobacco use and document tobacco use so you can assess changes. Um, advise uh, people who use tobacco to quit in a strong, personalized, and sensitive manner. And then refer them for further um, resources or treatment. Um, so you want to ask about tobacco use with a tone that conveys sensitivity, concern, and is non-judgmental. So something very neutral, like do you smoke or use other types of nicotine, such as e-cigarettes. Um, and then you can add, if you want, a, a rationale for asking it. Like I ask all patients because it's important for oral health, or we care about your health, and we have resources to help you quit. Um, and if you ask smoking status last time, you can just ask about changes in smoking status. Um, the next step is to advise tobacco users to quit in a strong, personalized manner. This is the hardest for clinicians because um, it can be hard to find a style that doesn't feel um, finger waggy. Um, something like, it's important for your health that you quit smoking and I can help you. So in addition to giving them your recommendation as a healthcare provider, it's important to, to say, um, it's not just that I'm telling you this, it's that I have something for you and I want um, you to know what resources are available. And that can really change the tone of the conversation. And then you wanna refer them to those resources. So that might be referring them back to their um, medical provider um, or pharmacists in some states can actually prescribe nicotine replacement therapy and provide counseling, um, including in Minnesota where I am. Um, you can uh, refer them to support programs that are provided with smoking cessation medication. Uh, there is a website called smokefree.gov, which has a texting uh, service to help people quit smoking, as well as some pretty good information. Um, and the thing that we're going to be talking to you about most today is the quit line. Um, there is a national toll-free telephone quit line called 1-800-QUIT-NOW that is operated in each state a little differently. Tobacco quit lines provide counseling at no cost um, via telephone to all Americans, and they are staffed by highly trained specialists, usually contracting with the state. So there's a couple of quit line vendors that cover um, most of the United States. It really varies what they offer, but usually at least five personalized sessions. Um, in Minnesota, you get uh, up to 12 sessions if you have a mental um, health diagnosis, for example. And some quit lines also offer pharmacotherapy at no cost. So in Minnesota, for example, we provide two week supply of the patch and the nicotine lozenge. And their success rate is about 28% for people who both use the quit line and a medication. So that's much better than the 5% quit rate we saw for people who quit on their own without help. Um, unfortunately, most healthcare providers and most patients are not familiar with tobacco quit lines. So just spreading the word is a, is a nice service that can help people change. Just so you know what to tell patients about what would happen when they call the quit line, the caller is routed to language appropriate staff. They often take an intake questionnaire on demographic information, insurance information, and their smoking behavior. And then they're offered a choice of services based on those demographics. That might include telephone counseling. It might include mailed materials, um, medications, or referral to local programs. Um, quit lines have a really broad reach and are recommended as an effective strategy in the clinical practice guideline.
So I'm going to pivot now from talking about what you should do in your practice to talking about an innovation to tobacco cessation that might be good for dental practice that we're testing um, in the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. For those of you who are familiar with the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network, we both offer um, trainings and um, information from research to practitioners, and also we conduct studies. And the reason it's so important to conduct studies in, in the network is that if we're going to do research that's applicable to practices, we have to do the tests in, in the setting in which the intervention is to be delivered. Um, and so one study that we're doing in the network now is called the Free Samples for Health Study. And the Free Samples for Health Study addresses the problem that most people who smoke don't use FDA-approved medications during quit attempts. That's one part of the problem. And the second problem is that oral health practitioners rarely recommend or prescribe uh, cessation medications to their patients. Um, so there's a novel approach that has been tested in primary care and not yet in dental care um, called nicotine replacement therapy sampling. And the idea behind nicotine replacement therapy sampling is to provide all patients who smoke, regardless of their motivation to quit, with free samples of nicotine replacement therapy. Um, this was tested in primary care clinics recently um, in 2020, and um, they found that giving out free samples of nicotine replacement therapy increased the rate of nicotine replacement therapy use by six times and increased abstinence from cigarettes six months later by 50% compared to a usual care condition that was just advice to quit smoking but didn't provide any samples. We think nicotine replacement therapy set, uh, sampling is a good fit for the dental setting um, where um, samples are common and um, people are often talking about the oral health, of, uh, the oral health effects of tobacco use. So in the FRESH study, we aim to test the effectiveness of providing free samples of nicotine replacement therapy in addition to ask, advise, refer on long-term abstinence from, um, from combustible cigarettes. And we're comparing the free samples of nicotine replacement therapy to um, providing uh, patients with an electronic toothbrush. So you can see um, here in the picture, this is, this is the sample bag that people get. So they get the, the free samples of nicotine replacement therapy, some fun steady swag with our logo, and then some information on quitting smoking and also information on um, medications. If you were to be a provider in the FRESH study, you would be asked to enroll 24 patients who smoke over a year, so about two patients a month. Um, those patients would complete a screening form and electronic survey on a tablet. And then you would be asked to, to deliver a less than five minute script um, talking to your patient, uh, delivering ask, advise, refer, um, as well as telling them about their sample, either their electric toothbrush or the nicotine replacement therapy products. And then you would give out the sample bag and you and your patients would be compensated for that. Before we uh, launched the main clinical trial for FRESH, we conducted two pilot studies. The first was just to talk to providers, maybe some of you, about um, what their thoughts were about nicotine replacement therapy sampling and ask, advise, refer. And then the second um, study, was, we did a pilot study where we piloted all procedures and two practices. So you'll hear from one of the pilot practitioners, um, Dr. Lewis, later. So providers thought the benefits of the FRESH study would be that, um, you know, they thought tobacco cessation was important for oral health and that being in the FRESH study would help learn how to learn, help teach them how to do this better. They also thought that providing ask, advice, refer, and samples was feasible in their current workflows. And they thought that providing samples to patients would change the tone of the conversation from you should quit smoking to like, because you smoke, I have something for you that might help. Um, so a different tone to the conversation. They were concerned though about patient resistance, that patients would get mad at them if they talked about smoking. Um, they were concerned about disruption to clinic workflows, and then they had some concerns about not knowing what to say to patients about nicotine replacement therapy. So if you're interested in the FRESH study, um, you can visit our webpage, and I hope this will also be dropped in the chat. Um, there will be lots of opportunities to see this QR code at the end of the, the webinar. Um, you can also email the National uh, Dental PBRN, and they will... Um, they will forward that email along to the node coordinator in your region. We're currently recruiting from the Midwest and the Northeast regions of the PBRN. We're trying to get 50 uh, 
practitioners to participate. So with that, I'm gonna um, bring on our panel. We're gonna answer some of the questions that you um, submitted prior to the webinar. Um, uh, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Joanna. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Sandra. It is now time for you to send your questions through the Q&A chat box. And uh, we are going to start our panel discussion with Dr. Lewis, Pentel, and Brindal, who will be joined Dr. Japontich in our panel. Um, before we introduce our first questions, I would like to introduce you our panelists. Dr. David Lewis is a general dentist providing care at Health Partners Dental Clinic in Eden Prairie, Minnesota and he's a longtime member of the National Dental PBRN, where he participated in several clinical studies. And like Dr. Zapondic mentioned, he did the pilot for the FRESH study to help um, patients quit smoking by providing free samples. Uh, we are also joined by our Midwest director for the network, Dr. Brad Brindle. He's a practicing dentist at Health Partners where he specializes in TMD and oral facial pain, and is also a senior researcher interest in TMD and oral facial pain. And finally, we have Dr. Pental, a physician and researcher interest in developing medications for tobacco use disorders. He just showed up now. He was the director of the Tobacco Dependence Clinic at Hannah uh, Healthcare for 30 years. But now he continues to help patients quit smoking at the clinic, not as the director anymore, but as a provider. And he's also a professor, professor at the University of Minnesota. We will start with the questions that we received in advance and then move on to the questions in the Q&A box. The first question uh, actually is for Dr. Lewis. We want to learn how was your participation in the FRESH study? And also you can share with us, why do you participate and do PBRN studies? Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this uh, presentation. And I hope that uh, my words can help encourage others to participate. Um, I think for, for me, the reason why I participate in PBRN studies to begin with is because I, I, I want to make a bigger difference than just what I'm able to do in my practice for my patients. And this is a really great way to um, create a avenue where we can do research and make a difference, a, a, a bigger difference than what we can just do in our, in our dental practices. Um, the FRESH study um, is a really much more simple a study to administer than some of the other practice-based research network studies. Um, because in the FRESH study, um, you have a engagement with the patient to enroll them in the study, but then all of the follow-up from this study is done by the, um, the, the research coordinators. So from a practitioner, um, you are you know, finding the patients to, to participate in the study. But then once you've found them, there is not any follow-up that you have to do after um, you've engaged them in, in, in starting the study. I've been a part of other PBRN studies where there are one year, two year, three year follow-ups um, and, uh, or even six month follow-ups or anything like that. And that is not part of this study. Um, so in terms of ease of use, um, this is one study that's very easy to, to integrate into your, your practice. Um, if you're just beginning and wanting to start doing PBRN studies, this is an excellent one to get your feet wet um, and, and see what running a study in your practice is like. I think there's one more reason, um, one more important reason why um, doing PBRN studies are important or why I choose to uh, participate in these studies. And that's because I really want to provide the best evidence-based care that I can. And this is a great way to create the evidence to provide 
patients the best care I'm able to provide them. Um, so it, it's it's a way to to get integrated into best pay, best practices through evidence based research. Um, so if you're interested in those types of things, I really highly encourage you in thinking about participating in this study. Dr. Lewis, this is music to my ears because as a teacher of evidence-based practice and methods, uh, I love to hear uh, when we get this kind of feedback about the network and about what we do. Our next question, I think, will be to Dr. Pentel. How do you handle patient resistance to talk about smoking? And I bet Brad can also help with that. Dr. Pentel, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I my experience has been that most smokers are uh, really very willing or wanting to talk about quitting and to get information. Uh, if it's presented, like Sandra said, in a supportive and a helpful way, um, you know, most the overwhelming majority of smokers would like to quit if they could figure out how to do it without driving themselves crazy. And um, so they're, they're really very open to this. Most of them try on their own each year. Uh, I, I think it's helpful to start with a question rather than a directive, like uh, have you thought about tapering your smoking or quitting and, and whether they say yes or no to follow that up very quickly with, I can help. Um, I can help with suggestions. I can help with medications uh, that will make it easier for you. And um, in the same vein, uh, rather than uh, emphasizing the harms of smoking, it can be phrased as the benefits of quitting. You know, if you quit smoking, your periodontal disease is going to be easier to manage. So I, I think if it's done in that way, um, it, it usually works. Uh, one thing patients often come back with, it's not so much resistance as um, skepticism, is I tried, I've tried and I've tried. And, uh, you know, quitting is a learned skill. And each time somebody tries, they learn a little bit about what worked and what didn't I try to convey that to patients and if they've tried and they've tried trying again gives them an even better chance of quitting especially if if you'll let me give you a little bit of help and uh, here's some medications that you can try see if you like them yeah let me, let me build on Paul's comments uh, just a little more detail as I do it in a dental setting is to say, you know, after, after explain, you know, why we're talking about tobacco, you know, just the brief introduction on that, I, it is actually has some impact on pain outcomes as well, even though it doesn't cause pain, but it does have impact on improvement. But it just ask if they're currently interested in quitting, I think as Paul said, and, and if they say they're not interested in quitting at this time, that's okay. Uh, you know, I, you, you have opportunities you know, also, I do ask, have you attempted to quit in the past? And so I have some sense of their past experiences that might be influencing that uh, decision. Uh, but, you know, offer them supportive messages in the future. Like, you know, if they say I quit several, tried several times, as Paul said, you know, I say it can take, most people take several attempts before they're successful at quitting. I think also if there are, they're not interested in quitting now, you can also speak to them about Gee, you know, when you are ready to quit, we can help support you more. And also it can be, I even refer to the quit line, suggest the quit line, because even though you're not ready, they can give you some additional information about, you know, increasing your chances of success in the future. So there's lots of messaging just to have a dialogue with them without being judgmental, without telling them what to do. And um, and some of the work we've done in that space have shown that patients, I think others have said that, really do expect their dentist to talk to them about tobacco if it has an impact on their oral health. So by not talking to them, I think you are missing an opportunity to build a rapport with your patients uh, because you're showing that you care for their health broadly. So, Thank you, Dr. Rendell. Our next question is, how long is the best converted smoker? Um, I hope I'm understanding the question right as how permanent is uh, 
uh, quitting. Uh, you know, when somebody quits, most relapse happens in the first week. So somebody who has quit and remained abstinent for six months is likely to remain abstinent for the duration. Uh, you know, there's less than 10% relapse after six or 12 months. And that's what the FDA uses as a criteria for approving smoking cessation medications. And uh, so somebody who makes it out to that point is likely to remain uh, a non-smoker. I think we've also come to realize that even in people who have quit for a while, uh, relapse happens. Um, it's not a tragedy if you just get back on track and do all the same things, you know, just quit again. Uh, because it's, it's really best viewed as a, a chronic relapsing disorder. If you stay with it, you'll quit. So I, I think Sandra mentioned that uh, each, um, uh, you know, each year without uh, any effort by anybody, um, smoker, about 5% of smokers will quit on their own without any help from anyone, uh, which is a very low rate. But if you look over a lifetime, 50% of smokers have quit smoking, uh, which must mean that if you just stay with it and keep trying, it's going to work. But six to 12 months is a very good result. Very interesting. And if the dentist can help with that, it seems that the rates will be even higher on quitting smoking. The other question we have here is at what age in the pediatric population, like adolescents, like teenagers, can we help with smoking cessation? And what kind of techniques or approach would help this group the most? Maybe Dr. Zapontich? <laughs> yeah, so Paul, Paul and I, this was a one submitted in advance, so Paul, Paul and I can tag team this one, but um, so there are no FDA approved medications for kids. That, I'm not saying that pediatricians don't use smoking cessation medications with kids or with people who vape, and I did see a question about vaping in the chat, um, but right now there's no FDA approved medications for vaping and there's no FDA approved patients for uh, medications for, for kids. Um, so I, I'm going to put some resources up for kids and for vaping um, that you um, are welcome to recommend to your patients. I think it is important to talk to uh, kids about the same things you'd talk to adults in terms of how smoking or vaping is um, harmful to their health. I will say um, the research on vaping is, is in its infancy, and we don't know a lot about the long-term health consequences of vaping, um, particularly not for oral health. Um, what we do know I, is, am I correct, Sandra? That this study is focusing on combustible. Yes, and so vaping. right. So for that reason, we're we're focusing on combustible cigarettes. But I understand that you might have come to this webinar to learn about vaping. Um, and so if you did, um, we don't know yet uh, much about the long term effects of vaping, and certainly not the long term oral effects of vaping. What we do know is that kids who vape. Um, often become kids who smoke. So, uh, so talking to patients, you know, uh, uh, recommending quitting is is fine. Um, referring them back to their pediatrician if they seem pretty dependent and they seem like they might need medications. I wouldn't prescribe medications for them in the dental office. I think that that might need more of a specialist. But you can certainly refer them to these resources um, if if they want some kind of behavioral treatment for uh, quitting vaping. Do you have anything to add, Paul? I, I agree with all of that. Uh, uh, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, acknowledges that the FDA hasn't approved these meds for uh, anyone under 18, but they do um, endorse considering nicotine replacement uh, for, for kids who are adolescents who are moderately or severely dependent. You know, for me as an internist, or I, I think for dentists, it's probably best to at least consult with or refer back to a pediatrician or a primary care uh, provider, um, but to definitely follow it up because um, that's, that's when kids start using tobacco and start smoking, and it's the best time to intervene if, if the kids are willing to give it a try. Paul, can, can I ask you a question? The quit line? Uh, can the teens call the quit line? Because it's, yes. you know, they can do the replacement therapy, the 
and RT, but maybe they can do the quit line with that. Yeah, so, so National National Jewish Health, which is the quit line vendor, I think for like 17 states or something, certainly the quit line vendor in Minnesota, they have an adolescent quit line called This Is Pudding. Um, so yeah, I, I would imagine that you would have to call with a parent, but um, um, yeah, they do offer services to kids. And texting services too. Um, Smoke Free Teen is a texting service. Go ahead, Brad. Dr. Rindo, go ahead. Right, Paul, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question to that. You have some good things you say when people ask about safety of, of vaping. And I think that would be something worth sharing too. I mean, as Sandra said, we can't say with certainty, but you've talked about what are all the additives, chemicals in there that can potentially be harmful. Yeah, there's uh, kind of a perception that vaping is just getting pure nicotine, which is uh, hardly the case because the nicotine has to be uh, dissolved in chemicals. There are others that are in there to, uh, as uh, flavorings or to improve the quality, uh, you know, the ability to generate a vapor. And um, we, we know very little about the safety of those chemicals, especially long-term um, when they're inhaled. Uh, you know, it, it took decades to recognize the long-term effects of smoking. So um, uh, this really is an unknown and those questions aren't gonna be answered anytime soon. Um, it's uh, uh, regulation of vaping products is really also in its infancy and uh, there aren't any um, enforced regulations even for vaping products to list and disclose everything that's in them. So, uh, you know, a lot of people feel that they have, um, they may turn out to have a role, not for kids, certainly, but for long established smokers who can't quit other ways. But um, I think we're still needing to learn whether that's the case. But, but your so, point is there's there's a lot of chemicals in there that we should have some concerns about. That's, I think, the take-home message I get. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I would say when patients ask me about vaping, if they are somebody who smokes and they want to quit, if they ask me about vaping, I tell them about FDA-approved medications for smoking cessation because we know that those are safe and we know that those are effective. However, if they come to me and they say, I was smoking a pack a day and now I'm vaping and I'm not smoking at all. You know, I say congratulations um, because we think that smoking is much, much less harmful than, than cigarette. We think that vaping is much less harmful than cigarette smoking. Now, Paul says, great job. Now let's form a plan to get you off the vaping. <laughs> so, um, you know, the long-term goal being abstinence from anything. Do you want us to go through, are you going to ask the questions in the chat? Uh, yes. So, uh, Dr. Lewis, we have a question here related to the FRESH study. Um, maybe the question is that someone come to the clinic and provide the materials and guidance to start the program with the dentist and assistants. So can you um, expand on your experience doing this study and how that training took place? Sure. Well, I first want to um, say that the study coordinators are so good about coming out to the offices and walking through um, the study protocol, um, even some of the scripting that you can use um, to help uh, the staff um, with the introduction of the study to patients. Um, so we're really well equipped because the, the study um, nodes do such a good job of setting us up well. Um, then in terms of enrollment, I was really surprised how little effort it was to um, get as many patients as I did enrolled in this study. Um, there are, like earlier in this present presentation, people are eager to quit and they are eager to actually um, know if you have resources to quit. And they're even more eager when you tell them that you have samples um, to that, they, that we could give them uh, to help them stop quitting. Um, so in, in terms of the interest, uh, patient interest in this study, it's really high, um, much higher than I would have anticipated um, going into this study. I thought maybe we would have trouble recruiting um, patients, but we had 
no trouble at all um, recruiting patients for this study. Um, then from a process standpoint of um, how, how do we actually enroll a patient in a study? Um, for me, it was, it was really the hygienist doing the, the, the hard work of reviewing somebody's medical history, including the use of nicotine use, and then having them kind of introduce the patient to um, what we could do to offer them help to, to stop nicotine use through this, this particular study that we were doing. Um, and so the mechanics um, became quite easy as some of the pre-work um, was already done by the hygienist in terms of generating interest from the patient standpoint in this study. Um, so then, you know, I got the, the handoff and um, took them just a little bit further. And then, you know, you've got a happy patient because um, they're getting more samples uh, from the dental office to help them with something that they've tried to do um, in the past or are interested in doing, um, but just maybe not have been successful. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, how, at what point does the patient learn that they will receive an electric toothbrush or a nicotine replacement uh, products? This is so, another question from uh, an attendee. And uh, the follow-up question to, to that is, is there follow-up required for the patients? Do they need to come back to your office to see you? So the patient learns um, that after the consent, they learn what condition they're in. So they have to do the consent and they have to do the baseline survey um, be before they learn their condition. Um, there is follow-up required for the patient. It is all done remotely. They um, have electronic surveys uh, that they do. And some of them um, also do a, a carbon monoxide test through their cell phone. Uh, they get a device that connects their cell phone, which the patient thought was really cool. <laughs> and they liked. Um, so yeah, that's when they learn. So there are there are um there are four follow-ups for the patients, and they do get paid for the follow-ups. Online, right? On uh, uh, online, yep. Not going yeah. back to the clinic. Right. I just want to reiterate that there is nothing more that the dentist or the dentist team or the office needs to do after um, enrollment. So it is a enrollment in the study and then that's it uh, from the dentist standpoint. Um, so it's, it's a really easy study to participate in. And I wanna say you can be a dentist, a hygienist or a dental therapist. So uh, we take all specialties. Um, so this is a, a fun way for hygienists to get involved in the PBRN team. Yes, that was one question. Can hygienists do this, this study alone? Absolutely. Yeah. Hygienists <laughs> are the ones doing most of this work talking about smoking. Yeah. We have another question here about how long the NRT can be administered if patients will ask about, if patients are asking, how long can I stay on this? Uh, the, uh, the, the good news is they are so safe that long-term use um, is, is safe, has been studied. You know, a usual course, minimal course of nicotine replacement is three months. Uh, there's a lot of data that suggests that six months is probably better, especially for uh, uh, people with um, uh, uh, other, uh, other problems, um, especially uh, serious mental illness. Uh, but uh, it, there's safety data for nicotine replacement products out to many years. Um, so it's um, generally, it's just not a concern. Uh, I do have some patients who have been on one or another or combination nicotine therapy uh, for several years because it seems like whenever they go off of it, they relapse. And I think that that's uh, a decent trade-off. Thank you, Dr. Pentel. Um, we have one question here about what percentage of people are likely to deny smoking if asked. Other than a non-judgmental approach and seeing signs of smoking, how can you help this group? that denies that they smoke, but you clearly see signs that they do smoke. 
or should you help them? I don't think anybody can readily answer that question because we really don't know if they don't tell us. So that's a tough one to answer. I mean, uh, you know, I guess I just my take on it, if I had some clinical suspicions of that, I would kind of just ask some additional questions and see if they would kind of understand why we're asking the question, because I it's conceivable that people might think it's none of our business. Uh, so I, I understand the question, certainly, but uh, I think that's one approach I would use if but I can't I don't think we have any numbers because uh, that we can speak to uh, Sandra. Paul, maybe you know more about it than I do. You know, I, I, I think the key to it is asking in, in what appears like a supportive, non-threatening way. And, uh, uh, you know, if somebody says no and you suspect that they really are a smoker, uh, you know, something like, oh, well, the reason I asked is because uh, for people who smoke, I can, I can help them quit. And uh, maybe that on a next visit, they'll tell you a little bit more. Yeah, this is the reason that we're supposed to do this at every visit, because sometimes they give us different answers and it gives them an opportunity to get treatment. Or maybe they quit and they relapsed or they started smoking. It's good to catch all of that. I, do, I think um, uh, asking the question in the right way is important, too. Uh, I've, I've had patients who tell me they don't smoke. Um, uh, but if it's asked, uh, have you smoked in the past month or have you smoked in the past year? The answer is yes. And then you might want to just make sure how durable it is and what do they mean by not smoking? Is that I don't smoke at all or I just smoke once in a while? We are close to the hour now. I think we can I have one quick um, last remarks from all of you. Um, and if you have not had your, answer, your question answered, we may follow up. Uh, by email with you. Um, the time span for this study is until we enroll the 24 patients. It depends on your workflow. And, uh, and that's the participating dentist will be in the study for that amount of time until they enroll the patient. The patient stays a little bit longer. Um, that was answering one of the questions here in the Q&A. But I would like to thank you for attending today. And um, Sandra, can you have our closing remarks? And we will see you next time. <laughs> oh, um, well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I just wanna reiterate that uh, patients wanna be asked about their tobacco use. They won't find it offensive, uh, particularly if you're providing resources and that the quit lines are a great way to uh, connect patients to smoking cessation treatment. And if you want to learn more or get more practice with this or work with this wonderful team of people, um, please sign up. Can I, can I ask one quick question in there? Uh, someone asked if they work in a facility that does not allow reimbursement or re, re, uh, stipends. Uh, we can work through that. We've encountered that with other groups. So let us know and we'll figure out, try and figure out a solution. So if you are interested in participating of the fresh in the fresh study, please email us at nationaldpbrn at uab.edu. If you have any questions, comments, um, compliments, <laughs> you can uh, shoot us an email. Thank you very much for our panelists. Thank you very much for your time with us today. <laughs>